Welcome to Kensington, your hometown church for great community and quality refreshments. Help keep the auditorium clean by depositing litter in trash receptacles. No talking or texting during the service. And be sure to use the Kensington app or visit the Starting Point team after the service to learn more about Kensington and receive a free gift. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy the service. It's morning, just a morning, it's a big night out. Gotta go to the show and a good time time. It's fun, fun, and Kensington. It's fun, fun, and Kensington. It's fun, fun, and Kensington. Yeah. All right, well, good morning. Well, hey, listen, we're going to kick off the last week of our four-week series, Kensington Goes to the Movies with a Bang. We are going to start out with a game uh, of movie trivia. So all of our contestants, come on up. If you Come on up. Just walk right up on stage. Uh, we have 10 contestants. And by the way, they were literally chosen. I'm sure you saw me walking around choosing contestants at the last second. They have no idea what's in store for them. And so we're going to do this family feud style. You five stay over there, just kind of in line. You five just remain on this side. So here's how it's going to go. They represent this auditorium. There is an imaginary line right down the middle. And these guys are all chosen from this side of the auditorium. So we're going to call you uh, Team One, all right? So let's hear it for Team One, your representatives, all right? Uh, this side of the auditorium, these guys have all been chosen from here. Let's hear it for Team Two, all right? So first contestant, come on up. Stand next to the table. Come on up, first contestant. Now, you have to have your hands behind your back. I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, it'll be on the screen as well. You can look. And listen, here's the important thing. You don't have to wait until I uh, end my sentence. You can slap at any time. The first one to slap the table in the boxes gets the answer. And if you don't get the answer right, then the other team gets the opportunity to steal, just like Family Feud style. So are we ready to play? Get, all right, yeah, here we go. All right, here is, it's a movie quote. Here is the quote. Hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. Name the movie. Yes. Zorro? What is it? Zorro. Zorro. The answer is not Zorro. All right, and so you get a chance to steal. Do you know the answer? He does not know the answer. All right, so uh, I don't know what to do in that case. All right, so, all right, just go to the end of the line. The score is zero to zero. Next contestant. Come on up, all right? Hands behind your back. I'm going to do another movie quote, and you guys, the first one to slap, gets the answer. Here's the quote. Why so serious? The Dark Knight. And the answer is The Dark Knight. All right, team number two. It's one to zero. Next contestant, come on up. Good job, guys. And uh, here, now this next one is a multiple choice question. Again, you can slap at any time, but I'm going to read it through. All right, here's the question. What type of candy does Elliot use to persuade E.T. to come into his room? Yes. Skittles. Skittles. The answer is not Skittles. What is the answer? M&M's. M&M's. The answer is Reese's Pieces. All right. Very good. That's all right. I, I mean, these guys are young, right? I mean, who, who would have expected them to uh, know old people movies, right? Because that's, that's my movie. Okay. Now, this next one is also an, a trivia question. All right, here it is. All right. Where was Forrest Gump shot, therefore sending him home from Vietnam? Yes. In the buttocks. The answer is the buttocks. All right. Good job. The, the score is two to nothing. All right. Let's go ahead and hear it for your next contestants. All right, guys. So go ahead. Hands behind your back. And this one is also going to be a multiple choice question. All right, here it is. In what movie did the song Staying Alive originate? Yes. Saturday Night Fever. Saturday Night Fever. The answer is Saturday Night Fever. All right, very good. Um, that, that, there were only five questions, and all three of them went to team number two. So give these guys a round of applause. Thanks, guys, for playing. Good job. Very good. Wow, that was uh, quite embarrassing, side number one. I'm so sorry for you. Um, when you leave, I hope that you just carry that shame with you all the rest of the day. All right, very good. 
Well, hey, listen, I am so thankful that you are here today. My name is Chris Zarba. I'm the pastor here, and I just want to welcome you here. If you're visiting for the first time, we would love for you to uh, visit the starting point table, uh, which is uh, located right outside. It's actually the Hub Center. Go there. We have a free gift for you. Uh, I, I do have a couple of announcements. Hey, can we have somebody come grab this table? Um, I, this table is supposed to be not in my way. Okay, so... <laughs> Uh, we have a couple of announcements, and here's the first one. Uh, if you don't know what's coming up uh, next Sunday night, we are doing an outdoor baptism on August 5th at Stony Creek Metro Park. Now, if you've never been to one of these, I promise you, you will not regret attending, even if you don't know anybody getting baptized, because we all are together, you know, 3,000 of your closest friends on one big field. There's going to be food trucks, or no, I think it's dessert, isn't it? Dessert. And then um, there's going to be uh, a live band, a stage, uh, baptismal pools over the beautiful water during the sunset. And most importantly, not just that, but uh, you can come, by the way, bring your blankets and chairs, and you could bring picnic stuff if you want to come early. But most importantly, we're going to be celebrating hundreds of people that are going to be making a profession of their faith getting baptized. Now, if you're here also, the more important challenge that I want to give to you is this. If you're here and you've never been baptized as an adult, you've never made a conscious choice to make a public statement of your faith, I know that probably like you, you have a lot of questions. I was baptized as an infant. Like, what does that mean compared to adult baptism? And like, how does that go together? Well, we have a video online that basically explains all of that. It's kensingtonchurch.org, which is our website, slash baptism. All of that is answered on there. I would love for you to just consider it because when I was baptized as a child, that was my mom's decision. Uh, but when I was baptized, uh, when I was 16 years old, that was a public statement that I wanted to make to, to, to make public following Christ. Now, many of you, you've, you, you were trusting Christ maybe even decades ago, and you've never taken the plunge. I just want to encourage you, go online and take the plunge with us. There's no better uh, environment to do it in, okay? And then finally, I want to inter introduce kind of our next series after this one. It's a series called Shift. And we're calling it Shift because we're talking about shifting our paradigm, shifting the way perhaps that we might believe, shifting the way that maybe the patterns of our behavior even. The book of Ephesians is what it's based off of. Ephesians is based off, it's written uh, based on the first three chapters talking about belief and the last three chapters talking about behavior. And so we're going to be talking about together as we look at a four-week study on the book of Ephesians, what does it mean to talk about belief and behavior and how does that matter? And does it matter the way we behave? And what does the Bible have to say about unity, about purity, uh, about harmony, and about victory? And those are the four topics. And so we are going to tackle those together in our next series. We're excited about it. So hope you are too. Well, we would love to get started. We are entering week number four in our series. And we're talking today about the movie, The Greatest Showman. Has anybody seen The Greatest Showman? Raise your hand if you've seen it. All right, well, today we're diving into that together, and as we do, we would love for you to stand up and shake some hands of the people around you here this morning.
Well, that was incredible. I love that song in the movie. In fact, I love all the songs in that movie. But that was unbelievable, wasn't it? Uh, when those little kids start singing, you're like, oh, look, the kids. You know, and, and it's a great song. But more importantly, the song is about a man or a boy, actually, who was dreaming of everything he wanted to do and everything he wanted to become. And then the rest of the movie, essentially, he goes on a journey uh, trying to do all of those things, and he makes some very significant discoveries along the way. I love The Greatest Showman. Uh, I'm a musical guy, but even if you're not a musical guy, uh, hopefully you'll still love it. In fact, hopefully the clips today, if you've not seen the movie, uh, you won't even uh, you know, have needed to because they stand on their own in terms of the direction of where we're going today. Uh, I encourage you to go online and, and watch the previous weeks if you haven't seen them. In week one, we talked about Star Wars, and we took our cues from both Luke Skywalker and the Apostle Paul. It was The Last Jedi. Uh, and then uh, week number two, we took our cues from Augie in the movie Wonder, and then also The Woman at the Well. And then last week, if you weren't here, Drew Daniels, our young adults pastor, did a great job taking our cues from both the Black Panther and then also four unnamed lepers from the Old Testament. Well, today, we're going to be taking our cues from P.T. Barnum in The Greatest Showman, who, who, by the way, is responsible for the birth of the circus, right? If you haven't figured that part out yet. But also, we're going to be taking our cues from a very familiar passage of Scripture that's very similar in Luke chapter 15, known as the prodigal son. So that's where we're going today. Would you pray with me as we dive into this together? Well, Father, we thank you for this morning. God, thank you for every person here in this room Lord, or listening online. I pray, God, that you would please meet us where we are at today. Lord, thank you for your blessings, all the blessings that we don't take time to notice. And Lord, there's no doubt that each one of us carry our own set of worries and struggles things that we're dealing with as we walk in through these doors or as we click online. Lord, we're carrying all of it. 
And then deeper down inside, Lord, we have things that go to the deepest recesses of our heart that we're feeling about ourselves and about our accomplishments and about our worth and about our performance and everything else. So God, I just pray that today that your Holy Spirit may speak into those things, that you may, from your word, Lord, help us to hear from you. And Father, we pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen. We're going to take a moment and receive our offering at this juncture in our service. And if you're visiting here today, this moment isn't designed for you. Uh, you can let the, uh, the offering pouch pass. But if you're here and you're part of Kensington, uh, we, want, we want to encourage you to give, actually, and we thank you for it. Uh, we, uh, every single thing that we collect, I, I promise you, it goes straight out through these doors, hopefully uh, accomplishing everything that God has called us to, both here and around the world. And so we are very careful to always say thank you for giving, for trusting God and what it says in his word about giving back to what he's blessed us with, but also for trusting uh, you know, us in our leadership and what God has called us to as well. And 70% uh, and of you uh, and above give online, so thank you for giving online as well. So as the offering is passing and as you're getting ready for that, I'm going to tell you a quick story. Um, <clears throat> when I was 18 years old, I went off to Bible college, and my girlfriend, who is now my wife, was exactly 803 miles from my dormitory to her driveway, and we held a three-year long-distance relationship before the internet, which means handwritten letters and everything else. Well, I remember uh, my wife uh, sending me, and I kid you not, she sent me eight to ten things per week. She wrote me a handwritten letter 365 days a year for three years in a row. She never missed one day. I, I kid you not. Yeah, give it up for Liz. Yeah, why not? But, but it's, it's who she is. So anyway, on Sweetest Day, which I didn't even know was a thing, uh, she, she decided to mail me a bunch of chocolate. And she knew I loved chocolate. And so I get this care package, and it was massive. And I opened it up, and there was everything chocolate in it. She even found a chocolate bunny because her, 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 uh, her sister worked at a chocolate place. So she got, like, chocolate boxes of candy, and she got chocolate, you know, Hershey's Kisses, and she got chocolate bars and all these different things. And there was so much chocolate in this box that I was like, I looked at it, and I just immediately started to salivate. And I thought, man, I'm going to tear this thing up. And so I thought to myself, I can't wait to dive into it. Now, before I dove into it, here's what I thought. I remember thinking, after I eat this entire box, my happiness level is going to be up here, right? My satisfaction is going to be up here. I can't wait. This will satisfy. This is the best thing in the world, right? And I kid you not, I just blazed through that thing in less than like a day and a half. And I ate everything in it. Now, Here's what you've probably already figured out. <laughs> Not only are, were you able to figure out that I probably got sick from the chocolate, but you may have also been able to connect the dots and say, I bet you after that, he didn't like chocolate and avoided it. Okay, not only is that true, but what you may not have guessed is that 30 years later, I don't like chocolate. I kid you not, 30 years later, and those of you who know me have heard me make that statement that I don't like chocolate, which is so weird, right? And by the way, are there any weirdos like me that don't like chocolate? Okay, God bless you. Uh, oh, I feel you. You're in my club, right? There's only like five of us in the whole auditorium. I, I literally avoid all chocolate, and who would have ever have thought that when I open the box and I'm thinking to myself, literally, this is going to bring me this much joy, it's going to bring me this much happiness, this much satisfaction, and yet it radically accomplished the opposite. Now, have you ever done that? Have you ever done that where you, 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 you kind of dove into something that you thought was going to bring you joy and happiness and fulfillment and satisfaction, and it brought you the opposite? Well, let me ask you a, a deeper question. Better yet, how many of us, and you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you have spent whole sections of your lives pursuing something that you thought was going to bring you fulfillment and satisfaction and joy and happiness, but it turned out, that it didn't. I've met so many people over the years who spend their lives pursuing money and security, and there's nothing wrong with that at all. But when you put so much focus and you put it on this pedestal and you think to yourself, it's going to bring me all that, what I've found over the years is that people who actually achieve their goals, it's great because you know finances are a blessing and God wants us to have all that in security. But almost always, in fact, I could almost even say always, I want to say always, uh, everybody who gives me that story says, I thought it was going to mean more. I thought it was going to fulfill me more. I thought it was going to just be different. Like, I'm glad I have it, but at the same time, it wasn't what I thought. 
And all of a sudden, it's different, right? Because there still is something that doesn't satisfy. I've met a lot of people who spent sections of their lives pursuing pleasure. And, and this is probably the worst pursuit because it, it, it's so extreme. Because at the beginning, uh, you know, giving yourself into every pleasure, whether it's addiction or whether it's any other kind of pleasure, what ends up happening is, is it's great at first because pleasure is a gift. But then even pleasure over time and distance will leave you to what I believe is the universal cry. And that is after a while, it leaves you more empty than almost anything that people, you know, run and chase after. I've heard people tell me their story about chasing approval of others. And by the way, I think we all do this to some degree. I think that we, you know, fashion and, you know, kind of like, you know, form our lives around other people's opinion of us. We, 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 we think and calculate our responses, how we answer questions, the choices that we make on, on a subliminal level for the approval of others. But some people actually may not even know it, but they spend sections of their lives pursuing approval of others. And that's a dangerous place to be because when the approval is there, you feel great. But if the approval is ever gone or if it can change in a moment, it leaves you where the, you know, the pursuit has to start up again because all of our worth and all of our value and our, the opinion of ourselves is wrapped up in somebody else. And you and I, if we've lived long enough, know what it's like to pursue things that we think is gonna do something up here and in the end, we figure out that it's an empty pursuit. Well, I have to tell you, that is the story of The Greatest Showman. In this first, we're going to show you three clips. The first set of clips, there's two clips that basically talk about, P, it's a loose uh, story on P.T. Barnum's life. There are some things that, that, that aren't necessarily true in the story, but what is true are the things that we're about to show you uh, in terms of broad strokes. And here's, here, here's what is true about him. He's famous for being rich and famous and starting the circus, but he was driven because he was very poor. He was the son of a tailor. And there were two pivotal events in this clip uh, that basically drive him for the rest of the movie to, to achieve and want to be more than he was. So take a minute and watch this. Um, I anticipated your reaction when he struck the child, the whole <gasps> right? If you haven't seen the movie, especially, you're like, oh my goodness, you know, but it was back then, right? And when it comes down to it, uh, you know, these are some of the driving forces uh, that send P.T. Barnum on the rest of the movie trying to obtain uh, goals of wealth and status and power and respect and all the things that he spends his life pursuing. Well, there's another story that we're familiar with in the Bible that has a person on an empty pursuit. And we're looking at that, and it's found in Luke chapter 15. Look what it says in verse number 11. It's known as the prodigal son. Jesus tells this story, and he says, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. Now, let me pause right there for a minute. I've highlighted the word younger because uh, back in the first century, customs were kind of viewed and respected almost like laws were. And so it was very customary for, number one, the, the older son to have the rights of which portion of land he wanted in the estate. But also, it's also very customary to uh, take care of that after the father has passed away. So the idea of asking a father while he was still li alive for his inheritance was incredibly disrespectful. So right away, the listeners of this story immediately knew the audacity audacity of the younger to talk to his father about his inheritance when his father was still alive is incredibly over the top. So let me just pause and say, why don't you guys try that? Uh, go to your parents while they're still alive and be like, hey, uh, hey, dad, I got an idea, you know, and let's see how that goes over, right? But listen, in the first century, it was equivalent to saying, and I, and I, and I'm kid, I kid you not, dad, why don't you just drop dead? That's the way that people heard it. So it goes on and it says, so he, the owner, divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together with all that he had, and he set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. Now, uh, squandered his wealth, meaning that, um, you know, he decided to pursue a wild living filled with, as we can only assume, uh, ladies were probably included in that equation. Who knows, maybe alcohol, but certainly uh, irresponsibility with wild living and with, with extreme wealth. 
comes, I'm sure, all sorts of pleasures and things to buy. And <clears throat> we all know the story. I mean, it, isn't it funny how even after thousands of years later, we all know the story within our own culture, right? We know how that goes. Immediately when you have a bunch of money and you start throwing it around, you're going to gain a lot of friends really fast. And this is the scene. But things take a turn for the worse in verse number 14. It says, after he had spent everything, right? So there you go. There was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. Let me stop there. Uh, spent everything, meaning that somehow he thought that extreme wealth at a really young age with no accountability was the wisest thing for him. And even though that the father knew better based on the persistence of the son, the father, for some reason, went ahead and gave him the wealth, and he's learning the lesson the hard way. So he runs through his entire inheritance, and it says he's been in need. It is probably the first time he's ever been in need in his life. Based on the story, based on what we read, we, we know that, you know, this, this is a, a, a young man who had a rich father, so chances are this is his first experience like this. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. Now, let me stop there. This is a Jewish boy in the story who goes off into a city with Gentiles or those who are not Jewish, those who have different beliefs. And feeding swine or feeding pigs is the lowest possible humiliation for a Jewish boy, right? Because well, we, all, we all know that pigs are unclean animals. And so this is the job that he absolutely had to take. And so the, the story is very specific. It's very intentional. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating. But then it says, but no one gave him anything. So uh, all his friends that he acquired, uh, all the relationships that he built up or acquaintances, everybody's gone. He finds himself in need, and he is so desperately hungry that he, that he longs to eat the slop that he's feeding the pigs. And things take a turn for the worse. Well, we're going to rejoin P.T. Barnum and The Greatest Showman. And let me tell you the scene that you're about to see. Uh, P.T. Barnum has much success with his circus, but he wants not only the respect from the common people, but he wants respect from the rich people or the wealthy, because after all, his parents were wealthy. So what he does is he, he, he uh, employs a singer to the wealthy named Ginny Lind. And so you're going to see this scene of him on stage as he's trying to gain the respect and approval of Ginny Lind. And then you'll see that no matter how much he has, no matter how much wealth he has, no matter how big his house is, none of it is enough to fill the emptiness that is still inside him. So take a minute and watch this. Isn't that a powerful line? I mean, again, if you have a little bit of experience under your belt, think about that, the weight of that comment. You don't need everyone to love you, just a few good people. I mean, for those of us who have a couple of decades under our belt, how true is that? And, and it's a big deal, too, because when it comes down to it, we understand that. We resonate with that. That's the tension of the movie, but it's also a tension that relates on so many different levels for us and the things that we struggle with and all of our different, you know, circumstances and the way that we were raised and the longings that are in our heart and the empty feelings that we have personally. So let me ask you this question. It's this question that I want you to try to answer you don't have to answer out loud, but have you ever felt you weren't enough? I think to some degree, all of us have felt that way. And, and again, this is an amazing question because it, isn't it funny? Uh, there's, there's only really two, at least two categories of people in here. Uh, those, those of you who believe and trust in Jesus Christ and you say, oh, I, I, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus Christ. I consider myself a Christian. And those of you who are maybe still considering it or maybe you are, you know, not quite there yet or maybe you're not considering yourself a Christian. And, and there's a lot of categories, but at least those two. And so here's the amazing thing about this question. You would think that, you know, if those people who don't know God, you would expect a pastor or somebody like me to say, if you just come to know God, then you'll never feel that way again. But the answer, that's not the answer. That's not true at all, is it? Because even if, you, you, even if you've been a Christian for decades, there are moments in our lives where we have to wake up every day and we have to remind ourselves of the lessons that we're learning and also the lessons that God teaches us and they have both to do with others and with God himself because not only do we not feel enough at times with people around us, but if we're really honest, we don't feel enough when it comes to our heavenly father. 
We don't feel enough. We don't feel worthy enough to do the things that we're asked to do or invited to do or to be a part of or perhaps even to walk in the doors of a church. I, I got to tell you, I, I felt uh, not as extreme of a way, but, but somewhat similar to P.T. Barnum and his uh, wife who grew up in this rich household. I kind of felt that way coming from the poor side on the wrong side of the second set of railroad tracks in Youngstown, owning a bar and, you know, brothers involved in gangs. We were very poor. And I'm dating this girl, Elizabeth, whose father had, a, you know, some money and owned his own company in the suburbs of Youngstown on the outskirts in Austintown, Ohio. Did you know that my, I met my wife when I was only 14 and she was 16 because I'm a player? So anyway, <laughs> and um, she had a car that was really appealing, but... Uh, when I started dating her, did you know, my point of the story is, is that did you know that she was forbidden by her father to go on my side of town? She was forbidden. So I'd say, hey, Liz, can you come pick me up? And for months, she would say, well, and she'd try to come up with all these excuses until finally we got close enough for her to confess and say, my dad has forbidden me to come to your side of town, Period. I mean, in some ways, I can relate to that. And so can you imagine as I'm trying to win the hand of this girl and, you know, from my background, I mean, it's really funny as I watch that, not to, you know, the extremes like they were, but in a way, I'm thinking, I felt that way. And I think that all of us feel that way, even later on in life. You know, when it comes to our boss, you know, when you deal with your boss and, and you're just looking for a, you know, I don't need much, just, to, just a pat on the back, just a little bit of affirmation. A little bit of like, hey, you're doing a good job, right? That's probably the case. Uh, when, when your family, when you walk in through the door, you know, you would appreciate just a little recognition for, you know, women for keeping, you know, the house clean or maybe coming home from a job and working really hard, whatever it is. I think that there are times where we wrestle with others. Have you ever felt like you weren't enough? And then also with God. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to show you and we're going to conclude the end of the of, of the. Uh, uh, the Greatest Showman, before we conclude the end of The Prodigal Son. So I'm going to show you the last clip that we're going to watch in The Greatest Showman. Now, this is important for you to understand. P.T. Barnum, through his exchange with Jenny Lynn, the singer that he hired, through that, that, that goes south, and he loses everything. He mortgages his home. He loses his home. He loses his riches. He loses everything. His circus burns down. I'm telling you, everything. He has nothing. And in the end, he's feeling sorry for himself. And so the scene that you're about to see is him in a pub, and then his circus friends are going to come and remind him of some things. But I want you to not only enjoy this song, because of course they're going to sing about it, right? I'm going to sing about the lesson of this movie. But, and it's, it's, so, it's, it's like the greatest song ever. It's so good. But as you watch this, I, more importantly, I hope that you pay attention to what's going on inside and the lesson that he learns. Okay? So watch this. And so, uh, yeah, clap for P.T. Barnum. Why not? <laughs> it's so good, isn't it? And, and by the way, I bet you the people who clapped actually saw the movie because you're, cause the other people are like, oh, that was a great clip. The other people are like, this was a good movie. I love the whole movie because it's a great movie, isn't it? It's such a great movie. And, uh, and so, listen, there's, there's, there's a lot of lessons to be found. Uh, but for P.T. Barnum in this moment, uh, it's, this, it's this statement right here. He found out that he is enough to his wife and kids. Uh, it's a great thing to finally arrive at the fact that, uh, you know, just earlier throughout the whole movie, you, you saw the clips where he just said, I wanted to be more than I was. You know, don't, you don't understand. You know, I, I was treated poorly, and he has this emptiness inside. But what he discovers is after everything's gone, everything that he spent his whole life building up and getting after he lost all of it, what he discovered was is that he didn't have to do anything to be loved and accepted by his wife and kids, that they wanted him just as he is, uh, with, with no performance. I mean, no, no money, money or no money, it doesn't matter. He doesn't have to do anything, doesn't have to be more than he is, to, to realize that you are enough to the people around you. Now, for you and me, that may be our wife and our kids, it may be our family, it may be our friends, it may be at work, but to know uh, that we are enough to the people around you is something that all of us strive for. We all want to, uh, you know, feel that and know that, and certainly that is a great lesson for, the, for this story, for this movie. Now, for the other story that we're going to dive back into in the narrative in the Bible, we're going to find out how that plays out. So look what it says in verse number 17. 
So the, uh, just as a re reminder, okay, so he's sitting there feeding pigs. He has nothing. He has no one. And it says in verse 17, when he came to his senses, there was a moment of realization. There was an aha moment. He said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. And so he gets a plan in his mind, and he says, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. And then he says, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. Now, what's interesting about this is he's rehearsing this. You can picture him still feeding swine, and it says he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and then he came to himself, or he realized and said, I have a plan. I know that I have sinned against my father, but if I approach him, maybe he'll treat me as a servant, and, and, and even my servants. I mean, I know my servants. They obeyed me. I'll just join the ranks of those I used to boss around, and I'll have more food than I have right now. So this is the plan. So let's see the father's reaction in verse number 20. It says, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around his neck, and broke it. I'm just kidding. That's not what the scripture says. In fact, down here, that's the ZMUV. That's the Zarba made-up version, right? I just want to see your reaction if you were paying attention. Because because that's what you would think would happen, right? That's not what happened. So let's look at the real version. Okay, so it says, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Big difference. But when it says, I want you to notice a few different phrases. While he was still a long way off means that the you know, Jesus is telling this story. It's very intentional. It says, while he's still a long way off, meaning the father was looking for him. The father never stopped hoping that he would walk up the road. And then it says his father ran. It, it very specifically does not say the son ran home. In fact, the son probably uh, didn't feel worthy to run home at all. So the father makes a point, drops everything he has, and runs to where his son is. The father is the one who runs. And then it says he falls on his neck and he kisses him. Now, before I go on to the next verse... It's important at this juncture for you to understand, and most of you might if you grew up in church, but the reason why Jesus told this story is he told it as a parable. He told it as a parable, and he said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. Jesus told this parable to reveal the heart of our heavenly Father and how we are. So in other words, the Father in the story is God. The, the prodigal son or the wayward son in the story is you, and it's me. The, all the many times that we are unfaithful, all the many times that we go out and we have an empty pursuit of trying to run to other things to fill us, thinking that we know better than what God says is good for us, going outside of the care and the direction of our Father and to run out and say, I'm just going to do what I want to do, and then we spend sections of our lives learning the hard way. And whether you do it before you come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior and you become to know God personally, or whether you continue to do it after because we do it after a lot. We are reminded of what Jesus talks about. Jesus, is, uh, Jesus and God synonymously, his heart for us is about to be revealed. So the father hugs him and kisses him. And then look what it says in the next verse. It says, the son said to him, now this is great because it's the same uh, speech that he rehearsed. Okay, he starts his speech. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But before he gets to the end of his speech, it says, but. But means the father interrupted him. But means the father wasn't even listening or will not listen to the rest of what his son is saying. And he probably knows what his son's going to say. It says, but the father said to his servants, quick. Bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, so they began to celebrate. And I want you to notice that he called him this son of mine. This son of mine, which goes against 
what the, what the son was about to propose. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Just hire me as a servant because I know the property. I'll work for my food. And he says, no, it's not so. You are my son. You were lost and now you're found. You were dead and now you're alive. The context of the story was given by Jesus when he was talking about, uh, he was talking about the heart of the father because he was accused with eating with sinners. That's how Luke 15 begins. If you don't know the context, Jesus is eating with sinners and a bunch of religious people come up and say, why are you eating with people who are so sinful? And Jesus tells three stories. He tells the story of the lost sheep, which has the same one. Jesus, you know, the, the shepherd leaves the 99 and goes find the, the one who is lost. He tells the story of the lost coins. Go back and read it, right? The first 10 verses, he tells the story of the lost coins. Do, you know, if you have 10 coins, don't you, don't you uh, if you lose one, don't you sweep it until you find it? And he tells the story of the lost sheep and the lost coin. And then he tells the story of the lost Son, And all three stories are, are, are meant for you and I to understand. And here's the lesson behind this story for you and for me. The story says that you are enough to God. That regardless of your past, regardless of your waywardness and my waywardness, that you are enough as you are. And I think that so many times we lose sight of the fact that God calls us his children you are a son of God. You are a daughter of God. And, and we try to attach our identity to so many different things. You know, we, we feel like our worthiness is attached to either money or security or, or whatever it is, approval or sports or performance or what we can do for others. And we attach it to so many things in this world. We'll even attach it to different relationships and we'll find our identity based on what people think of us in a romantic relationship. We do all sorts of things. And yet what we fail to realize in this story, the heart of it is, is, is that regardless of how you try to identify yourself, God identifies us as his children, his beloved children. You are loved, you are accepted, and you are valued, and you are enough to God. And so it's, it's amazing because I think a lot of us in here, uh, you know, maybe we have a lot of questions about God, maybe we've heard references about this, but just know this, that there's only one reason why Jesus can love you the way that you are. Because Jesus died on a cross to pay for your sins and mine. You know, the whole story of the gospel, uh, the whole uh, hallmark of the Christian faith is based on an event grounded in history that we talked about last week where Jesus Christ died on a cross and he rose again from the grave conquering sin and death. And the Bible says that Jesus Christ died on a cross to pay for your sins and for my sins. And actually, if you want to talk about God and Jesus, uh, the role of the Father is that the, the Father has a will for you, but we're separated from God the Father, and Jesus Christ is referred to as the mediator in the Bible. How his job is to reconcile or bring together us and our Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ. And because of him, we are enough for God. And so, Really, if you look at both stories, if you look at both, uh, you know, the, the, the lesson that comes with P.T. Barnum and you look at the lesson that we learn with the prodigal son, this next statement is true. In the end, what matters most in life is always who more than what. Isn't that true? What matters most in the end is always who more than what. And you found this out as a kid, right? Because when you were young and you were playing with your friends, it didn't matter really what you had. There are those of us in this room that you would say, I was poor and didn't even know it, right? It didn't matter what you had. It was always about the who that you had. And when you went to junior high and high school, that was even reinforced even more. It really didn't matter what you had. It was always who you had. When you went on to your job, it didn't matter what you had. It was always who you had at the end of your life. Uh, you know, uh, I see a lot of funerals. I, I, I've never heard of a person on their deathbed say to somebody, to the nurse, hey, wheel me out to my car so I can make amends and have the last five-minute conversation of my life with my car. Nobody does that, right? Nobody says, hey, I, I really need to talk to my house, right? Nobody does that. At the end of our lives, we, we realize that in the end, the most important thing is always a who. And it's always who over a what. No, we, we know this. Here's, here's what I want to build a case for today. It comes down to, I don't have it on the screen, but it comes down to what Jesus said from the very beginning. It's when Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? 
He said there are two greatest commandments. The first one is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second one is just like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. And all the law and all the prophets hang on these two commandments. And what Jesus was saying to the people who knew the law, in fact, that question, I don't know if you know this or not, that question uh, was asked to Jesus by a lawyer, someone who knew the law. He had over 600 laws that he kept and knew as a Jewish uh, you know, student. And yet Jesus said, the most important commandment is relationships, and it's God and others. Your relationship with God and your relationship with everybody else. In other words, that's both stories. With God, that's the prodigal son. Your relationship with others, that's P.T. Barnum. We understand that the lessons that we learn in this life comes down to what Jesus said. You see, there's a reason why you and I connect with great stories. There's a reason why when we see great dialogue, you know, great narratives like this, that we pay, you know, money and, and it makes millions of dollars and it's a blockbuster hit and we, we, we view that. And there's a reason why we wanted to clap afterwards because you're like, oh, it feels so right. And I think I've tried to build the case every single week that it's amazing how you can find the gospel or the story of God in some of the greatest stories on our silver screens. Because it comes down to what resonates in our heart. And the reason why it resonates in our heart is because it's what Jesus said was the most important thing from the very beginning. You were designed to have a relationship with your heavenly father and with others. And those are the most important things in life. So not only does that speak into our pursuits, but it also speaks into our identity. It also speaks into your worth. And it's amazing how before we come to know God or believe in God, and even after we come to know God, how we spend so much of our lives wasted trying to fulfill ourselves with things. And we need to be reminded over and over that you are enough to God and that you are enough, period. And you should be enough to others because we, we are who God says we are. And regardless of what we have done and regardless of what we will ever do, you are enough as you are. Because in the end, what matters most is always who more than what. And Jesus invites us to go to him ultimately. So yeah, others is a great lesson. But I just want to kind of direct your attention more toward the prodigal son invitation and just ask you the question, is Jesus enough for you today? Is God's approval enough for you, for your self-worth? Is he enough for what you're struggling with? Everything that you feel you know, is missing or empty in your life and trying to fill your life, can we just pause today and just accept the fact that God says we are enough as we are and we just need to lean into him I heard a song on the way here today that reminded me of that. And as I was driving here, it came on the radio and I thought, God, that's just like you to remind me that I'm enough and that everything that I feel like is missing and I'm just like you, I want to pay my bills and save and I want to strive for promotions and I want to pursue things. And when things don't go my way, I mean, we struggle with it. And God always gently reminds me through the power of His Holy Spirit, Chris, you're enough. You're fine. I've blessed you. I've favored you. He has given us so many good things. We just need to continue to go to him and realize that the empty pursuit of life is not worth another moment of our lives. Let's pray together. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for today. God, I thank you for loving us the way you do. I thank you for valuing us the way you do. And I pray, Father, that whatever it is that we're dealing with, whatever it is that we're trying to achieve, whatever it is, Lord, that we want to accomplish, help us to know, God, that we are enough to you. And I pray, Father, that we may uh, live lives pursuing healthy relationships in community with one another, not only with our family members, but also with those around us that believe the same thing. And Lord, hopefully we live lives being enough to them as well. Father, give us those kind of relationships. And if there's somebody in here that just wishes that they would have that type of relationship, Father, I pray that you would surround them with those people who would give that gift to them. And I pray, Father, that all of it points back to you. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to run to you in all things. Father, thank you so much in this moment for us being enough, for dying on the cross, for, for forgiving our sin, for viewing us as righteous, for calling us holy, 
but most of all for calling us your children because it is you who says who we are. It is you who defines us. We love you and we thank you and we pray all these things. Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite you to uh, sing if you know it. We're singing a song that uh, basically tells us, according to God, we are enough. the highest king would welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me his love for me. Oh, his love
Well, I hope we not only sing it, I hope that we believe it, and I hope we live it. I pray that you're encouraged, and I just want to invite you back next week. And don't forget to sign up for baptism and everything we have going on. But come back next week and invite somebody with you for our next series called Shift. Thank you so much, and I'll see you out at the starting point table. God bless you. Thanks for being here. Thank you.